Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. My name is Andrew Visay. I'm the Chief Solutions Officer at New Rocket. We're here today to talk about the middle office. What is it? Why is it important? And more importantly, how can we make it more efficient and more effective? Uh, if you have questions for our panel today, please put them in the chat. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. Uh, our discussion today is with, with two industry experts from ServiceNow and New Rocket. We're going to talk about their experiences and how we can help solve some of the challenges uh, in today's middle office. First, I'd like to introduce Angie Campos from ServiceNow. Angie, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Angie Campos, Director and Head of Financial Services for the Commercial Market in ServiceNow. Uh, in this market, we have over 90% of all financial institutions by volume. I've spent my entire career in financial services, starting with about 10 years in management consulting, driving large scale transformations across the enterprise for almost every function, as well as digital customer transformation. And then uh, prior to ServiceNow was led global financial services solutions and go to market at MuleSoft. Great, thanks. Our second panelist is uh, Chris Pope from New Rocket. Chris, say hello. Hey, Andrew and Angie. Uh, so Chris Pope, Chief Innovation Officer and EMEA Go-To-Market Lead at Rocket. Uh, prior to this, many of you may have seen me, heard me. Uh, I was at ServiceNow almost for 10 years, uh, running the uh, innovation and evangelist team under Dave Wright, Chief Innovation Officer. And prior to that, I was a customer of ServiceNow uh, three times back in 2007 and onwards. Um, for those of you who remember um, back in the days of sort of the winter and the spring releases, and I was customer number 10 originally and ironically at a bank as well. So uh, happy to be here and, and get on with the conversation. Thanks, Chris. So let's get after our first question. So let's start with just what is your view of the middle office or what does it mean and, and, and what, where is it important to many businesses? Angie, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, so if you think about what financial services is, it's the manage the, the business of managing risk. And so when you think about division of responsibilities, there's the front office and then the middle office where the front office is really around revenue generation, interfacing with the customer and all of the kind of administrative uh, risk management activities are uh, separated into the middle office. But the middle office really has a much larger role. I mean, there are so many different types of risks that need to be managed within any given process, but also uh, different sources of data and procedures that need to be navigated uh, and, and numerous systems. And so there's a really important role of translation and being a broker as a middle office person. Um, you're translating the needs of the customer and the front office, the relationship manager, into uh, what needs to be done internally through procedures, through data, through risk, and all of the other components that go into facilitating a workflow, whether it is HR or finance or et cetera. And Chris, how about your view? Yeah, I mean, very similar, right? We often talk about IT being the service broker. I think of that middle office of people, process, technology. They bring it together. They're the glue, like almost the, the elasticity, right? That regardless of what's happening at the front and the back, they're the bit in the middle, right? And we hear a lot about investment in the front office, new markets, new products, new offerings, new services. And then sort of behind the scenes, the, the rapid expansion and growth of technology and cloud, et cetera. And then you get the bit in the middle that somehow has to pivot, change, adapt, adopt, and be very agile in what it does from a, almost an upstream and a downstream standpoint. And often, you know, I'm sure we're going to get into this, not blessed with massive investment in technology and automation and workflow, maybe not the coolest or sexiest place to work, kind of in the engine room, if you will. But I think without it, everything stops, mm -hmm. right? So they're that piece in the middle that really sort of the sinew, the tissue, the neurons that connect almost of, wow, we're out there doing that. That's kind of crazy. Wow, we're going down that route with AI, machine learning, whatever. How do we make it work in the middle? Right, and that's really where the, the genius is, if you will, in, in many yeah. organizations. And Chris, I think in our prior conversation, we also talked about, and we're talking very financial services today, but middle office exists in some form in many businesses. Would you agree? Yeah, absolutely. You know, whether, I don't know, you're a car dealer, whether you're in retail, whether you're in manufacturing, whether you're in pharmaceuticals, right? We just associate it with financial services, but it's a little bit like workflow. You look around and suddenly workflows everywhere. God help you if you have the experience of the DMV or buying a home or whatever, right? 
there's workflow everywhere. We just don't look at it that way. So I think when you think of the middle office piece, think of being a store worker, right? In retail or somewhere and you're on that front line or, or, or check-in staff at an airline in an airport, you ultimately want to get to the plane and travel, but there's a bit in the middle. Again, that, you know, and some of our customers have 300 subsystems in that middle that suddenly magically means you can get on a plane and fly, but there's people to fly it. There's a plane, your bags get there. It's all approved, it's been checked, it's got maintenance and facilities done. It's the middle office, we just call it something different. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think another interesting point there is why have middle office workers and functions struggled to, to get good tools? So maybe Angie, your thoughts there. Yeah, I mean, I think when you walk into a store, I love that analogy, Chris, um, you walk into a store and everything's well done and that really uh, impacts the experience that you have as a customer. And similar to that notion, there's been a ton of investment to make that experience seamless and, and beautiful. But really, the work that has to get done, you know, all the, the all the activities to set up the products in the right places in the in the store and to translate those products into SKUs and all that, all the things that make that work happen are unseen. And so. Um, there's been a lot of investment in creating that experience, whether it's the digital engagement channels or the data management um, systems to ensure there's a 360 degree view of that customer so that you know who you're talking to at any point. But what about the services that you need to be de delivering to the, the customer? How does that all get done? And it's an often forgotten and unseen um, bankless uh, operation, but Honestly, I think it's the uh, greatest revenue generator because of uh, the ability to change the speed of delivery um, of your services, which impacts really um, is, is the differentiation today in the digital world. Yeah, and, and Chris, I think we spoke before about sometimes middle office teams, they may have some tools that they work with or they may have some tools that they work around. Maybe yeah, you can expand on that a little. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and it's, you know, it's that old cobbler's children sort of scenario, right? Um, they're often sort of the recipient of technology as a byproduct or, or, you know, what we think is the right thing to do or, or the right thing to implement. And they kind of look at it and go, yeah, actually, you know, what, that doesn't make sense. That can help us. That can do certain things. But at the other times, they're not engaged as part of it. You know, we sometimes think we know better than the people that use the products, right? Maybe not always true. And you kind of sit there and go, you know what? We're tech savvy, savvy enough that you find ways around things, that you become accepting of it. And you're like, well, that's the way it's always been. We don't have any budget. No one really invests in us. You know what? We'll just get on with it. And in six months, eight months, Chris will be gone. There'll be a new broom. We'll figure it out then, right? And I think they just become akin to that way of working and almost accepting that it's swivel chair, it's cut, it's pace, they're not integrated. And look, we've heard this story before, we've seen this movie in IT operations and, and all these others, right, and in customer service as well. I think the difference in the middle offices is volume and scale. And if you go to some of these large, you know, financial institutions that, that Angie was talking about, yeah, the volumes are bonkers, right? Absolutely bonkers. And you say, where's the break point? And you start doing less and, you know, versus, and it's not about massive, massive transformation, but often it could be one small thing that you do hundreds of times a day, times a hundred people could revolutionize the organization rather than ripping it out and gutting it and starting again. It could just be a small thing, but it makes a material difference to the organization. Yeah, I like the term that I think both of you used was that that middle office as a broker inside of the organization. They're moving things from here to there and making sure that it's all happening. And and it's not a straight line. It's a it's a web of information that's moving around. Mm -hmm. uh, next question I have for you is, is how much do you think um, how our middle office teams work with their tools is a function of how successful those tools are? Chris, maybe first to you. Yeah, we're getting very philosophical, Andrew. <laughs> yes. I like it. Um, no, I think, you know, it's kind of like, should I work with it? Could I work with it? Is there a better way? And, and can I influence it? And I think, you know, if you sort of draw parallels to the consumer world, we have choice. We download apps on our phones. If you're a man, you don't read the instructions. You don't really know how to use it. So you delete it and do something else, right? Whereas you look at it, we have choice. We can pivot. In the enterprise, you don't you're kind of given sometimes what you get, right? And and you're like, yeah, okay, we'll be accepting of that. It gives me enough to get by, but I still love my little spreadsheets and my pivot tables and 
that enables me to do the work I need to do. In worst case, I'll send a Teams message or a Slack or you know an email to Angie and she'll help me out because she's the person that can help me out. But that breaks after a while and that sort of almost apathy in a way, you know, an acceptance but it builds in the organization. And then when you finally get to that point of where you could change it, you could transform it, it's such a move. It's like an act of Congress. It's a huge piece of work to do. And you're like, well, maybe there's a better way to do this. What is it we're struggling with? Is it data? Is it the process? Or is it the experience? Like Angie said, what if we just found a better way of navigating and joining the dots without having to sort of rip out the core DNA? Maybe that's enough. You know, and I think when you look at the fintechs and the startup banks, they're not doing anything different beyond opening a checking account or a savings account. That's been around forever. But what they've done is make it a much simpler and easier exercise to do it. Mm -hmm. And they can do it because they've got no legacy. Right. And I think when you look at it slightly different that way, it's not a new problem to be solved, but there's better ways of solving existing problems. And that's where I think the potential is for the middle office to say, we appreciate the work. We understand the way the work. But let's find a new way with new technology to make that a much simpler exercise. Yeah, and, and I think, Angie, before I go to you, we're going to send out a poll to all of our, our attendees just to hear from you. How do you feel about the current tools you have available to you? Um, I'd like to get get some input from our audience. So, uh, Angie, I guess same question to you. Of you know, how much do you think the troubles of the middle office are how they they interact and work with their tool set? I think it's um, it, it's a big part of that. Um, I mean, to build off of what Chris said, it's a lot of there's three kind of challenges, right? There's too much, too many technologies, too many lines of businesses, too many functions. Uh, the second is the fragmentation, right? There's too many of them, but each line of business or each function has their own view of what needs to be done and what uh, they're using to do it. And then the third is change. Change is happening constantly. From a risk and regulatory perspective, there's a new regulation every seven seconds change, uh, or there's mergers and acquisitions, there's growth, new customer acquisitions, and digital, things are constantly changing. And so when we think about middle office and operations, it's really the heart, the beating heart of, and the, the that circulatory, the system of the entire body. And in order to really think about a great experience, we need to think about it from a holistic perspective. Chris, you touched on this a lot with people, process, technology, right? And we talk about platforms and pl tool consolidation. A platform should be thinking across the board of people, process, technology. Is it engaging everybody appropriately with a single view of what needs to happen? Are the processes constructed in a way so that there's an understanding of what needs to be done for each task and why? Because there's policy and risk associated with that. And can they be uh, consolidated to the point where you don't have to have two types of credit assessment workflows when they're very similar in and of itself? So how can we create one system or one workflow that really can scale across multiple groups. And then from a technology perspective, it's integrating with all those systems out there. Why use 100 systems and do that swivel chair from one system to another and to keying in data, which which creates the risk of errors? Why not have it all integrated into a single platform? When we talk about consolidation, this is really it, right? But in, in addition to those integrations, you, really, you need that data model to, so that everybody's talking the same language. And this is a big part of that middle office is that translation, right, of, of customer needs this, how does that translate to, into the systems, into the data, into the things I need to do? And so a really that, that holistic operating model and transformation takes into account all of that. I think. And so um, as I, as business leaders in the audience, I would really urge, recommend you to really think about platforms from that perspective. Do they connect and unify all people? Do they have some a, a way to organize processes and scale them across multiple groups? And from a data and integration perspective, how does that help my uh, integration and data management needs? Yeah, and Chris, uh, maybe expanding on that, I, I like the analogy of the, the circulatory system uh, as the platform. Uh, you know, Chris, I know you have some thoughts along those lines. Yeah, everything Angie said. It sounded <laughs> quite smart for me. Um, no, I think you're right. You know, it's, uh, you know, we talk about integrations and, you know, there are large technology organizations within financial services, you know, companies. And I think many wore badges of pride or got honors, you know, for 
almost creating the most complex, fully integrated systems out there. And whether you're talking about big data and data lakes and enterprise service buses, you know, they're all great things and to some extent self-fulfilling IT projects. But what's the outcome for the people on the other end of it, right? And just because you create the most beautiful, most complex connected thing, if I still can't find the needle in the haystack, it's still a needle in the haystack, right? And I think when you look at it, there's still elements of that circular system that the people element, you still need to trust and verify that something mm -hmm. is. And I think, you know, I think Angie, you mentioned this earlier, right? People that are making risk-based decisions or are material risk takers for an organization, they act on data and they act on at some point, not you know, just in time or near real time. And they're making a decision on behalf of the organization and the institution, which, you know, somewhere down the road, if we read all the way back to subprime and all that, someone thought that was a great idea at some point, right? And it created the entire world. Um, but you look at that circular system, I, I, you can't ignore the people element of it and making it, and you know, experience is an overused word, right? We know that but their experience in their day-to-day -day job that when you connect the dots or join something or share a piece of data or collapse a platform, you sort of say to it, did I make you know Andrew's job better tomorrow than it was today? And if you can say yes, and you can incrementally make those steps and say, well, actually, hang on, Andrew relies on this piece of data now. We could get that three steps earlier in the process, at, you know, the point that that's entered into a system or it's fed through, that actually automates that piece of the process now. And it doesn't make Andrew redundant. It actually frees Andrew up to do more critical thinking or more sort of empathetic problem solving to a client who might be going through a, a particularly difficult, you know, mortgage origination or, or whatever it may be. You, you pivot and you free people up to do more human centric things and you remove that. the mundane and repetitive tasks that, let's be honest, don't really add any value to your day. Yeah, and that, that's a great. Uh, a great segue into into the first little segment I have prepared for us. Um, obviously, when we think about doing our work in service now, we can do lots of reporting and dashboards and, and pull things out. But one of the words that both of you have used around middle office is a lot of swivel chairing. So the, the first prepared little walkthrough I, I have for us, taking a look at how one of those workflows actually works in service now. So let's start that video if we can. And here's a little demo. What I've got is an example of uh, onboarding a commercial customer. So it's a very simple example, but I think it hits on many of the things that we, we talk about swivel chairing. So the first thing we want to help avoid our swivel chair is where am I in the process? And you can see we've got something that we call a playbook. And what that does is it shows me, hey, this section is already done and I can see who's accomplished each of these tasks. And as the person working on this, it drops me in at the, the next step. And I can see that we're in the due diligence step and we can see that we're on the know your customer actions. And you know, know your customer is critical, so we need to make sure that it's happening in a timely fashion. And we've assigned it to a person and I need to know how that person's doing. They're gonna come back with a result, but what I find is, is how overdue are they is often the question that we want to ask. In a manual task, it takes forever and we don't know. Here I can see we've attributed an SLA to this specific task for this individual, and they've got time left on the clock. You know, we're doing okay against our customer commitment. Um, I think that's a really big part of swivel sharing is we lose sight of that, you know, how are we doing on our process? And so the, this view gives that sort of middle office uh, person that's working the process a, a view of who's doing what, who owes what, and it fans that information out automatically instead of pivoting back and forth in my chair. It gives us access to all the information about this particular onboarding of a customer, including how am I doing on my, my time stages and my SLA. And I can see that overall, I've still got some time on the clock. We're doing okay. We're meeting our commitments. The other thing we talked about is the need for flexibility in the tool. So what I want to show is a little bit of, we'll call it the back end, but it's not the crazy coding back end. This is how did we design that process in a way that's readable as a business user? I can see here are all the steps that are happening. So it's the same thing that we were just looking at at the front end, but a little touch of the back end. And I and see where I've created some additional steps to wait for things to be completed. Don't start the next task, 
until this one's done. Um, and I can see as I'm going through each of the processes, it's, it's fairly organized and I can read it and understand it. And in terms of flexibility, I want to add another step to those checks I saw along the, the, the left-hand side. Well, I'm going to add another swim lane, essentially. Here's a new column in this workflow that says, let's go verify some of this information. And let's not start that because we're mailing some things to a customer. So wait a few days before we start calling. And now we need somebody to take some action. So let's just add a task, create a task that says, you know, assign it to the agent that's working it and make sure they call the customer. I think this is a really powerful element that ServiceNow has added in for us to be able to build workflows that are understandable and, and start to get the swivel chair out. And we replaced our swivel chair with this kind of a view. Um, so just an, an example of, you know, how do we, how do we get the swivel chair out and start to really work in a tool notable that that view that we were looking at was in a brand new ServiceNow instance. All I did was install the modules and start to run through. So some of those out of the box capabilities that ServiceNow can bring to bear, give us a great starting point. So we're getting at, you know, onboard the customer, but KYC activities and, and, and so on. So I see we have some of our, our poll results back. Um, let's take a look at what people thought about their tools. So 50% said automated and love their tools, which is honestly kind of surprising. I mean, many, many of the places where we go, we actually get the next highest answer, which is manual hate them or its <laughs> counterpart tools. What tools? Um, let's see. Manual love them and automated hate them got zero percent also a little interesting number um so i think it's an interesting interesting piece of data for us you know we've got automated tools um what kind of comes to mind for me is is they're automated but how connected are they within the enterprise angie to your point you know can we pull risk and compliance data from those tools um, how do they connect to other tools? Where are the integration points and, and where does that happen? Um, maybe I, I guess sort of capture your thoughts on the fly, Angie, first on just sort of what our poll results are talking to us about. Yeah, I, um, I'm i surprised by the automated love and the high, the high response rate of that one as well. However, I can see it being um, within a view of your job. When you think about, when you step back and look across functions across groups, that's when really the rubber hits the road, right? So that example that you showed with the demo of onboarding a customer with a AML KYC, is there the automation, the experience of automating that process might be amazing. However, it, does the risk function have appropriate visibility on how many times a high risk rating was given to a customer um, across the board per their policy? And if there was a, uh, a flag um, on there, suspicious activity report flag, do we have a view of all of them across the board and how that exceeds or um, go, meets the, or is under our, our risk tolerance? Um, from a technology perspective, if my system is down, does that impact my onboarding processes? Th that information, the more and more you're able to zoom out and connect all that data together, really that's where true business transformation and outcomes happen. Um, so maybe, you know, there's, there has been a lot of investment in automation overall. I mean, we're in the digital era. So I guess the 50% doesn't totally surprise me, but then I would, again, really um, challenge the, the audience to think about stepping back and looking across the enterprise. Yeah, and, and Chris, your thoughts on, the, on our results? Yeah, I would probably, <clears throat> Yeah, I'd probably say the same, right? But I think if you look at tools, what tools, right? When you think about it, <clears throat> what is a tool? What is an application, right? Uh, it, it's how long a piece of string. And I think, you know, there are countless examples of customers I've worked with where they've digitalized the front end. I think you showed some steps in there that we're talking about onboarding the customer and those things, right? And it was beautiful. It was branded. It was slick. All those good things. But because the regulators still required a wet signature, they still had to print the paperwork out. And you're like, well, hang on, we've made a little bit of it better for the customer, arguably it's the right thing to do. But then the bit of the actual work that the bank were doing was <laughs> no different whatsoever. And they were like, great, we just get more work faster, but we still need to do the same. 
Um, you know, and, and automating a bad problem only means you fail faster in a much more transparent way, right? And I think you look at that and you say, automated, love them, great, but are they fully, and when we say automated, are they connected? I think to your point as well. Yes, a single thing or whatever. And I think this is where you've also seen the onset of RPA tools, you know, that, that mimic human behavior because you know, legacy is what it is, you know, whether it's mainframes and, and other green screen technologies, they're not going away because they tend to work, right? Um, and they work for a very long time. Um, but connecting them, mimicking that behavior, right? And if you can do that and free up just a little bit of time before I need to go and fight the next fire, that's a good thing for me. But I think connecting the end to end journey is really where the value is. Um, but also, do you have a voice to be able to to change that, that's really hard to do. And whilst you've always got that burden of, you know, I remember back in the days of, you know, when JB, uh, Jamie Dimon was, was at, you know, I think at Congress or on the Hill, talking about why all these problems have come on in the banking system. He said, I have two and a half thousand consultants running around every day. All they do is respond to the new regulations and risks you put on us. I'll never keep up. It's not, a, and you know, there's industries built around this stuff as a result. And I think if you look at that instead, but, step back a little bit excuse me and say what's the problem we're trying to solve but who are we solving for that then gives you another way of sort of moving forward and to some extent shapes that technology and automation direction yeah yeah and, and to our participants I, i'd encourage you if you have questions uh please post them in the chat and I'll, I'll i'll throw a challenge out to our participants to see if you have a one of the challenges i found is i was actually working some workshops with a, a financial institution and I had a handful of folks in the room and we're trying to get aligned and we found out it, the light bulb went on when one group said, well, we have a team we call cash management. And another group said, well, we have a group called management of cash. We talked about them for probably 10 minutes until we figured out it was the same group. Uh, you know, I sometimes call it the, the Mike and Michael problem. You know, when we, we start to integrate our systems and think about digital transformation, you know, I, I know someone as Mike, in yeah. our directory, it's Michael. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we're merging systems where some data was good, some was bad. So my question sort of out to the audience would be, you know, do you have those kinds of Mike and Michael problems or cash management management of cash problems um, that we can maybe uh, weigh? I think, in? Andrew, just on that point, it's quite funny, a very large bank I work with, and you know, they're implementing CMDB and a bunch of other stuff. One of the things they were really keen on was the name of an application or a service but then they had a list of aliases that it's also known as mm -hmm. either because of <laughs> legacy or whatever. You, know, you call it this like, three letter acronym, you know, Angie calls it something else. But they, what it meant was when you went and searched for information or knowledge, depending on who you are, where you come from it, the technical it's like email outlook exchange 365, all the same things, but they actually maintained the library of alphabet soup that people can actually find the information they looked for versus try to standardize on a single name. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and to our audience that I'm asking for questions, I'll also uh, extend an invitation to join us for a follow-up session on May the 5th. Come have drinks with our experts. We're going to make margaritas together. So at the end of our session, we're going to throw up a QR code and a way for you to sign up. But come bring your questions to us there, and, and we'll make some margaritas and answer more questions. With the side of alphabet soup. <laughs> yeah. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah. And also, uh, if you, if any of our attendees are planning on attending ServiceNow's Knowledge Conference, uh, we will be there. Look for uh, for Chris and myself and Andrew will be participating in some of the different events. So uh, we hope to see you there. Um, maybe let's let's go on to a little bit of. We've used the term workflow a handful of times. Do you think our our business managers understand? the term workflow in the way that we use it in, in our landscape. Maybe Angel, I'll start with you. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know. I still talk to customers, a lot of customers and they, they just come back and ask, aren't you just a IT ticketing tool? And I say, Oh goodness, <laughs> we're starting from the bottom. So, um, really since I've joined, I've, I've been with service now for two years, even within the two years I've been here, my whole kind of perception has changed to kind of, start when i started i kind of saw this opportunity for middle office transformation and not just middle office transformation but operating model transformation to connect front middle and back office um, across the board with this 
with the unifying system of engagement where it makes sense or integrate and in, integration to other systems of engagement. Um, but now it's more, I, when I think of, about it from the, from the context of where we are uh, with the market and just the digital world, I kind of think of it as the digital bridge. Um, and, and I know that sounds pretty philosophical pie in the sky, but um, I can bring it down to something a little bit more uh, translatable. So when we, you think about how work gets done, um, it's all, especially in financial services, is the passing of data. Um, and data only resides in system of records. And so system of records, their kind of role in the operating model is to hold that data of what happened, where, uh, on what, how, exact, um, et, et cetera. But then what we kind of, we've branded ourselves um, as a system of action. So, you know, we talked about swivel chair and it's that, that um, act of taking a piece of data on one screen and system to the other and inputting that. Um, that's the bridge that I'm talking about with this, the, the digital bridge, right? The system of action that helps to kind of move that data across the board to fuel workflow. And it can be any data. And the reason I call that a bridge is because, you know, I talked about change happening constantly. Systems are changing, organizations are changing. So as those systems are changing on the back end, you still, you've abst essentially abstracted your actions, your services in a single place where now you have this unmatched visibility across the board. Because I think with the ServiceNow platform, an area of differentiation is the fact that we're all operations, right? We, we touch IT, we're a system of record for all your IT assets. Uh, we can connect to your system of record for all your employee, uh, employee information, employees and information about them, um, as well as facilities and vendors. And so with any given item action, we have the ability to map that to any part of our platform. So onboarding happens, you can, or I, I forgot to say one key area of system of record that we, we can act as is risk and compliance, your risk register. And so imagine taking an onboarding process and any given task, like conducting a uh, know your customer um, action that can be mapped to the underlying technology that it's performed on, the risk policy, the control even, uh, the people and maybe even their, their own um, license, you know, updates or compliance um, risk assessments. And so now we've kind of found ourselves in this new era of Service 360. You know, the last 10, 15 years is Customer 360, but now it's this holistic view of your service to really drive operational resilience. Sure. Yeah. And Chris, maybe same to you of, you know, workflows and, and how do we help our customers understand the way that we think about workflows? I, you know, I, I still think it's to some extent it's still a, a nerdy techie thing, right? And it's what we talk about and we're very comfortable with, but you know, does your mom understand what workflow is or your grandma? I don't know. And I, and I always try to think of it a little bit simpler and say, you know, really there's only four things that you do. You need help or you need advice, right? Number one. The second is you need to request or um, get something, right? New product, new service. You might need to modify something or change something that you've already got an existing capability or service, or you just need information. They're the four things, right? Now they feel very like help, change, request, knowledge, very IT, ITSM, and probably a little bit <clears throat> to your point, Angie, where the ticketing tool idea comes from, right? Mm -hmm. But I think if you go under the covers and think about what I, sort of three words I describe ServiceNow as is forms-based workflow, right? You capture data, I and then you do something smart with it. Now that could be a human making a decision, reviewing based on the data around them or contextual, or it could be machine driven, right? Automated, streamlined, understood, calculated, AI, machine learning, et cetera, and predictive, and it moves through the process. But I think when you look at it that way and sort of from an outcome or a value stream mapping, <clears throat> by doing this, it enables that, which occurs this to happen. And if you go back to those four things, you know, it, it's become too easy to do things in email, right? And almost instant gratification, but you lose audit, you lose control, you lose visibility, reporting, analytics, and so on, right? Which is why platforms like ServiceNow exist. But then when you look at that, it's not just to move the problem that you had in email and spreadsheets into the platform. 
you've actually got the opportunity to change the way it works and change the way people work. And it fundamentally comes down to those four buckets of things. And you say, well, some of them are, are very simple to do, right? It's sort of request, fulfill, action, complete. Others are actually, hang on, Chris is struggling here. This requires not just a standard knowledge article or SOP or automated workflow response. This is a stressful situation. This is a moment that matters. It's a life-changing moment because of what we're doing, insurance, health, whatever, it doesn't matter. The human's still required to step in, but when they do, the workflow supports them, providing them all the information of what happened before and potentially what can happen next to guide that conversation. So I've solely focused on you, the customer and the outcome, not ask you all the same questions, to get the answers that you gave to Andrew a week ago, I'm like, oh, well, Andrew's in a different department. I don't work with Andrew, and he's not here today. You're like, well, where's the history? What am I trying to, and it's just a poor experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's connected, you know, it's automated, it's integrated. And as Angie said, you know, it's about moving the data around at the right time with the right controls. Then you create a much better experience for people as a result. And, you know, it's it sounds quite simple, but I think the more simplistic you make it in the description, the more chance you've got of people understanding it and when they create an emotional connection and see themselves in it they're more likely to do it and then the resistance to change is lower yeah and, and you both mentioned the the risk the compliance aspect of it and, and i know from my experience in that space many times the expense and you know the cost and burden on the organization you know chris you mentioned you know, banks going up on the hill to talk about the burden of, of regulatory compliance. In many cases, the, the source of the cost is actually collecting and gathering evidence and proving yeah. that things happened. Yeah. So it, it's probably, you know, for those that are thinking about, you know, where's my business case for my middle office, we can take a look at, at well, you know, how much time do we spend trying to cobble together evidence? Okay. If I can change that to a push button exercise because we did it through an automated set of steps, which is workflow, and that's what we showed in our, our little example earlier, you know, there's a there's a real good case that your state of compliance can improve significantly when you just take something that was an email and, and you automate it. You know, the ability to reliably track that information is, is powerful stuff. And then we extend it a little further and think about the idea of resilience. You know, the pandemic has forced us to think, rethink what we think resilience means. Well, if I know, you know, step one goes to Angie and step two goes to Chris, and we had an interruption in between step one and two, but my, my system of record for that work and that workflow lets me know where do we leave off? And when Chris picks up at his new location, um, or, or a new person comes to, to, to fulfill that role, we know where it is. And, and by nature, mm -hmm. just putting those things into a tool make us much more you know, resilient. Seems like simple things, but I agree with you, Chris. Like the more simple we can make it and explain it, the better it is for compliance, the less risky it is, and the more resilient it is. Um, that. Sorry, just, uh, you just totally reminded me, and this happened to your boss, Angie, by the way. <laughs> Brilliant technology. Resilience, all those good things, failover systems, systems of record, etc. No one planned for a flood. And the ceiling mm -hmm. collapsed in the building. And they went, Well, where do our people now go? Yeah. <laughs> Inside to it, not just people, or sorry, not just technology, it's the people element as well. And you say, Well, and then you come back to the age of BCP, DR, and BCM. Mm -hmm. It's a big part of it. Now, you could argue every organization just got an ex extortion amount of facilities added to their, you know, their playbook, if you will, because everyone works from home. But then that adds other, you know, restrictions and capabilities around it or dependencies that you never had to manage before. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, 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 that, that, uh, that makes me think about the, the another point that I've, um, I'm gl glad you reminded me of that I didn't think about bringing up here, but you, you know, we talk about workflow and automation. Uh, and, you know, Andrew, you talked about how even document or automating that workflow and having an audit trail of what happened um, in and of itself is a huge lift of burden from a reg risk and regulatory perspective. But take uh, our the ServiceNow platform, which is really looking at uh, it, our major product suites looks at automating uh, operations for any given function, right? So if, if you've automated a workflow in the line of business around onboarding, 
we've also have the capabilities to automate the entire enterprise risk and compliance management lifecycle. So I, I talked about the linkages of data and how powerful that can be. But what about the linkages of workflows coming together? Chris, to your point on building goes out, what are the risk management or the continuity workflows that then come in to fix that and drive resilience? Yeah, and, that, and that's a great uh, a great setup for the the next little demo element I have prepared for us because I think in, in our discussion today it comes back to the individual employee and and you know how do they get work done. So if we take a look at our, our next video, what I've got here is is an example of how we build an employee experience uh, in the ServiceNow platform because pulling that work together, making it easy for our employees to actually be able to do their work. Uh, I would argue is is as important, if not more important, than getting our workflows right. So if we think about the resilience situation, I moved to a new location. What do I need to do first, second, third? Um, that's where we want to get to. Uh, let's see. So I think we're having trouble with our video demo. So maybe we'll talk about experience a little bit. So. I think where ServiceNow is unique and it's a particular specialty of, of ours at, at New Rocket is thinking about the, the end user experience and thinking about end user empathy. And as, as many clients that I've worked with always chuckle, you know, are we inflicting a system on them or are we providing them something that they actually wanna to engage with and it makes their lives easier. So Chris, maybe maybe you first, sort of the experience itself, what do I see as an end user? Um, yeah. you know, how do you see that fitting into folks' strategy around tools? Yeah, I think it, you know, gone are the days of looking pretty and rounding the corners on rectangular boxes. <laughs> but I, you know, what you can't get away from, a lot of this is still data entry, right? It is what it is. Now, you can challenge how the data gets there, number one. But also I think it's about context, right? Where am I in the process? What's the, it's like an information architect, right? What's relevant, when is it relevant, and does it help me make the next decision? Whereas I think historically, it's almost like you see these forms or, or, or designs in some platforms and everything's on the screen at once. And you're like, how on earth do I even make head nor tail of this, right? And there's, um, it reminds me way back, you know, I used to travel a lot at service now and I, I checked into a hotel once and you know what they're like they're tippy tapping away and you're like what the hell are you doing and i asked could i go count and find the counter and see what they're doing and they made 174 keystrokes to check me in and i'm like what are you doing and they're like all these fields we don't even use them we just tap past them because no one's ever going to change it we're just going to get over it but we work around the process to get you your key mr pope and you look at that and you say well what if there was a better way of doing it that for the point in time with the data that you've got, I've checked in, I've pre-checked in, I've got my profile, you've got my loyalty, you've got my ID, other than give me a card, what the hell is it you need to do, right? And I think when you apply that, of course, it's more complex in financial services, we get that, right? But I think what's the decision I need to make based on the data I have? And we assume a perfect process every time. That That's not true. It's about sometimes managing the exceptions, right? And if I've got 100 things to do in a day, and I know 90 of them are good to go, don't even show me. Let me focus on the 10, the exceptions or the breakages, for want of a better word. And I think, you know, if we look at some of the work that we've done with banks has been non-IT work, but around settlement, right? Back end, not the processing of trades necessarily, but the breakages where things have gone wrong or not quite balanced at the end of the day or whatever, an exception management, but then to pivot into sort of what Angie was saying about risk is where we've got material risk takers or controls that are regularly required, in this case related to MIFID in, in EMEA, you know, can we demonstrate those controls, but also where we've got algorithm trading and all those fun things going on. It's not the machine that being let loose. We've actually got that trust, that verify and the audit trail in place that we can go really, really, really fast, but we understand what it's doing, why it's doing and where it's doing it. And as you said, as a point in time, there's an audit trail. And I think the experience of that then is how do you expose it and make it meaningful and contextual to the end user, not based on the best some amazing developer can pull together. We know developers can build things, but you know, could you build it? Should you build it? That's the, that's the ask, right? And less sometimes is more because it allows me to focus on making the right decision and not have to swim through all the noise that really 
doesn't add any value to the situation or the, or the decision I'm about to make. Yeah, and I think we have our video loaded up. So let's take a look at a, a sample of an experience built in ServiceNow. So this is a, an example that, that we at New Rocket have built. And, and the first thing you'll notice is that it's personalized. So what's interesting in the way ServiceNow lets us provide an experience to someone is it knows who you are. So I, I know who you are. Let me present things to you that are useful and relevant to your day. Um, and you know, at New Rocket, one of our key focuses is design. So let's make sure it's clean, it's not cluttered, and it reflects you know your organization's view on how things should look and feel. And let's put all of those things that you're going to need access to, whether it's you know, in my example here, your popular items, things that you have to use frequently. Let's get to them quickly. Things that you need to approve or things that maybe you need to know about. So for example, you know, if there's an IT outage and Wi-Fi is out, well, that's useful to know and frankly might be activating some of those continuity and resilience plans. Um, and when we looked at the workflow example earlier of those tasks going out to do KYC, if you're on the KYC team, something shows up on your, on your uh, main portal here that says, under my activities, I need to complete the following things. So being able to start to deliver that unifying employee experience, I think is a really important element in our strategy as ServiceNow and, <clears throat> pardon me, digital transformation. Um, disconnected systems can just cause frustration across the board. Um, what we wanna be able to do is start to show, here is this portal, even if some of these actions, like I need remote access, and so that needs to take me somewhere else. Let's get that portal experience in a central place. Let's get it easy and accessible. And let's make sure that it's changing colors and, and forms and layouts based on your needs as an employee. What so I have there is uh, Julie's fluent in Latin. So Julie, <laughs> yes, well, that's true as well. <laughs> uh, Angie, I know ServiceNow spends a lot of time on user experience. Uh, maybe just give us a few minutes on kind of your thoughts on how we're doing user experience differently yeah i think um so the, there's two parts here there's the user experience in delivery so workflow needs to be designed and developed and before it's operated before it's implemented and then there's ongoing operation of it now the development um of the workflow design of that workflow has we've invested a ton in making that easy um, that process automation manager that you pulled up is exactly how easy it is. And imagine all this need for change, um, new workflows, regulatory changes that are requiring changes to workflow. Um, that can be done by anyone that doesn't need have to know code. You can just a simple drag and drop. Uh, and the, the nice thing about how we've architected the, the platform is that each of those little boxes that you saw is not just a task. It has the whole kind of operating model components to it, the people, process, and technology. So it comes with the right engagement um, system or the, the, the interaction component to the right persona, um, the process itself, uh, the integration uh, with the data that it needs to come, that needs to come out of the system that houses that data. And so as you're moving around, moving things around, uh, you, you're creating, you're configuring new workflows. It's not a, a customization. And so what that does is we're seeing customers where in my previous life as a consultant, it would take a year and a half to transform a digital experience, but we're seeing it in weeks and it's incredible. Um, and, and then you think about uh, kind of the ongoing governance of that. If I'm going to give all my line of business ability to create the workflows, how do I manage that? So we've invested a ton in governance uh, capabilities too. On the operation piece of it, you know, there's, I can't say enough about how my how much of my experience is um, about simplicity of knowing where to go for what. Uh, and I just got a new laptop, and everything has changed, so I don't know where anything is. But when it, when you think about the ServiceNow portal as a as just your place to work, that's where for the first time in my career, I'm at a company where I need to do this or that, or get a new laptop, or get a get network access. It's one portal, even for my customer, one portal. It's one place to go. It's, it's, it seems so simple, but the outcome is incredible. Yeah. Yeah. And you mentioned being able to get moving quickly. And I think one of the things that ServiceNow has done and continues to do is to add industry specific um, 
you know, pre-built workflows. I was able to do a demo of something that all I had to do was turn it on and it shows us here's the here's the great starting point. So maybe Angie can talk a little bit about what financial services means to service now in, in that way from a product. Uh, yes, I'm so glad we're talking about this. Um, I can't believe that there's a platform like this out there. Um, and and I, I work for that company. Uh, what we've done, you know, I mentioned earlier about how we've essentially created various product modules all on this single platform that automates every function. And now we're doing it in the line of business where it's arguably the greatest area of expense and revenue potential. Um, and so we're looking basically across the entire value chain of financial services. We started it in banking. We just went live with insurance and we continue to add breadth and depth to this product set that also can talk to natively every other product set, um, product suite on our platform. Um, the way that we've designed it is, um, you know, thinking about how we can transform the operating model. So people process technology. Uh, we've created, uh, we've identified the personas for any given function or financial services, whether it's deposits or payments or loans, identified all those personas, uh, created persona specific UI that the our customers can choose to use or integrate with a, a different engagement system. Um, from a process perspective, we've broken out these workflows and really think of them as building blocks. Yes, we have a couple, you know, a few, a good set of out of box workflows, but it, chances are your workflow is going to be very different from the your the bank down the street or the insurance company down the street. And so the ability to kind of drag and drop and reuse those workflows that has been broken down into those kind of building blocks, those boxes that you saw on, on process automation uh, manager in, in Andrew's demo. And then from a technology or data technology perspective, um, we're starting to build out out of box applications to key systems of record that will facilitate these workflows as well as align all of that to a single data model that we've now expanded to include all financial services. Yeah, and, and Chris, Angie mentioned that, you know, sometimes we need to extend what ServiceNow has done and we've got some real good experience there. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, you whether you think of an 80-20 or a 70-30 fit, a lot of what's out of box is good enough for some, right? Particularly if you're coming from spreadsheets, a legacy platform, unintegrated, manual, email. You know, it, it's been a regular service now story across every vertical or, or industry they approach. <clears throat> but I think when you look at the fundamentals of workflow, um, assignment, reporting, analytics, automation, the process designing you showed, you know, they're generic, they're platform capabilities. You can throw at anything. And, mm -hmm. and what we actually showed in the demo, is that any different than when we put sticky notes on the wall? And start to plan our work and do things. No, but we're just doing it in a much better tech-enabled way that mm -hmm. allows us to automate processes, but also get insight into the data that maybe um, we wouldn't see before as humans. That maybe the machines can help us with. And you know, and, and countless examples of where we've worked with financial institutions to some of those examples earlier around post-trade settlement, exception management, etc. But actually, what, what one of those came to us and said, "Hang on, this workflow thing's really cool." We saw it, whatever. Could you build a property management tool on it for us around managing our real estate and our assets? Because there's large contractual commitments, you know, reporting around it, huge financial commitments, but also it relates to the safety and security of our employees, our building, our assets, our information, our data. You can keep going, right? Um, so we're using exactly the same fundamentals that we built these, you know, non-IT applications for the business on. We built a global property tracker that's now got 71 buildings tracked and managed and operating. And it's now even gone to a level where when you submit a request to have access, you know, as part of a new hire, maybe you, you move from one department to the other and you need access to a different floor or a different room, whatever. It's requested through the same portal where I go and say my laptop's completely broken or I need a new app or, you know, I'm, I'm approving something. I can actually go and say, hey, you know, and, and, and it gets approved. And my badge is permissioned and I know I'll get access, right? And what have we done? We've become that data broker, we've become that automated workflow and integrated what would have been historically fill in the PDF, print it, sign it, scan it, attach it, send it. Right? That's what we've done when you think about it. And I think you, you know, if you look at those types of processes as an organization, you know, they're everywhere. They're absolutely everywhere. And when you know, fortunate I've been able to visit customers this week 
whilst traveling, you get to reception and there's that big red book that you sign in and say who you are and who you're visiting. Where does that ever go? Right? <laughs> Fire alarm goes off. You know, if vendors are in the building, maybe you, you leave them a little bit just to create a bit of stress. Um, but what happens when it's full? Well, they put it under the counter and they grab, grab the next one. And you think about health, security, physical security, safety, you know, and think about the perception you have when you turn up at that building. You think, okay, what's this going to be like? Versus there's an iPad, there's something that you check in on. It notifies Angie, I'm in the building, your visitors here, grant them Wi Fi access as a guest. Great experience. My, my perception of you as a company changes in terms of your digital thinking and use of technology. It just drives a better conversation versus the old turnout, right? And you're like, oh, God, here we go. This is going to be difficult. You already know it's going to be difficult, right? Yeah. And I go back to that, you know, example of the DMV. Come on, really. <laughs> right? No, yeah. no one. No one enjoys that progress, right? Um, yeah, so we're, we're coming up on our close to our closing time. So uh, I'll remind our audience to hang in there till the end to get your code to be able to join us for cocktails uh, on May 5th. Uh, Angie, 30 seconds to you. Any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, be, be creative. Uh, you know, we talked about just all the goodness of connecting data and workflows, functions. Um, the platform can really do anything and to drive that your transformation um, objectives really think about how all of that can be brought into a tool that really where you can be creative with your with you know all the outcomes and linkages so um, thank you all so much for your time yeah thanks and Chris 30 seconds to you uh, any closing thoughts yeah I would yeah, I would think about, you know, not the massive, hairy, audacious problems, but what are those simple things you do daily, repetitively, that are frustrating? And start small, prove the value, prove the success, and then grow it. And then find the next one, and the next one, and the next one. And over time, you probably find you've done an automated 50, 60% of your daily work. That's only a good thing, right? With small, incremental, very achievable, measurable steps. Yeah, that's that's great advice. So. Uh, for anybody that would like to schedule a, a, a follow-up with our teams, the ServiceNow and New Rocket teams, you'll be able to um, join us for cocktails on May the 5th. So uh, Angie and Chris, thank you so much for your time today. Thank Great you. discussion. Really appreciate it. All our attendees, thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks, all. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you. Cheers.